So that's me back in 2005. Uh, I'm an engineer, I'm not an artist. Yet that's my work, the National Archives Museum surrounding the Declaration of Independence. How did I do that? Well, I used what I call computer-assisted craftsmanship, which is to use technology to make uh, design, measuring, and building things easy for anyone. But I'll tell you more about why I think that's gonna end up changing your life in a minute. First, I wanna do a real-time uh, preview of how this technology can be used to make uh, in-ear devices. So we have a volunteer, Zoe, and uh, I'm actually gonna do a live demonstration of our scanner on, on stage. <clears throat> so, give me one second. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Uh, if you could put these headsets on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the, uh, the 3D scanner is actually three systems in one. It's a, uh, a laser scanner, a tracking system, and a ring scanner. So we're going to use all those three scanners at once in order to capture a full scan of Zoe's ear. And uh, you'll see on the left side of the screen a live view of her ear. So that's her ear. I don't know if it's hard to see or not. It, I can see it better on my screen. but. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the scan, and I'm going to do a quick scan of her ear canal. So those little blue lines that you see appearing are actually where I'm picking up data from her ear. On the right side of the screen, that is the 3D scan being built. And as soon as I get enough data to spin that around, you'll be able to tell that that's her ear canal I just scanned. It's kind of like painting your ear with light. As I move the scanner around, uh, it's like uh, if I'm missing data on the left, I move it to the left. If I'm missing data on the right, I move it to the right. And then I'll add a little bit of data from her concha, which is the outside portion of the ear. And then the scan is done. So I'll go scan the other ear. And it's pretty much the same thing. So I have to scan the, uh, both ears. And uh, you'll see the, the live image on the left side of the screen and then the reconstruction on the right side of the screen. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of hair. So uh, like I said, we're using three different systems at once to scan the ear. We're using three cameras that are 14 megapixels each. Uh, we're streaming four, uh, 20, meg or 20 frames per second. And so when we complete this scan, we're actually ending up transferring about 30 gigabytes of data. So now that the scans are complete, um, I'm going to step back out in the front here. We're using computer-assisted craftsmanship to do this 3D scan. And what that is, is it's a 3D scan um, in similar technologies like uh, computer vision and image processing. We take that, I mean, we're essentially giving computers eyes, ways to see and measure the world. And then with 3D printing and similar technologies such as CNC machining and uh, computer-aided design, we're actually giving computers hands, ways to uh, build and create things on the computer. By combining those two technologies, we actually end up with computer-assisted craftsmanship, which is the computer enhancement of fabrication. So this technology is actually uh, going to be integrated in every aspect of our lives. So it'll be uh, in consumer goods, it'll be in, uh, mili in military products, it'll be in medicine, it'll be in sports equipment, uh, and even in fashion and jewelry. Um, and as this technology is integrated, um, we, we can actually build things that we can never build before. So for instance, companies will now be able to deliver a product where they have a production volume of one. So that means no more one-size-fits-all shirts. We're going to actually have shoes that fit. And then we're going to have uh, custom consumer electronics. So imagine how much more efficient we can make that microphone if we actually knew where your mouth was and we could aim it right at your mouth. Or if we could reduce carpal tunnel syndrome by 3D scanning your hands and then producing custom keyboards and mouse, mouses for you. We're going to come to expect that level of craftsmanship from all of our products that we buy. But it's not just the products we buy uh, that are affected. It's actually going to change at home as well. Um, and it already has for some. So if you have a pet, you can actually 3D print a custom uh, water bottle for your pet that's portable that also serves as a carrying case for your, for your water bottle. Or uh, you could have a unique way of storing stuff, uh, in this case, uh, uh, memory cards for a photographer. Or uh, unique to your situation, you can come up with solutions. So what's interesting to me about this this hook is actually not the hook itself, but that this hook is not adjustable. So very likely, somebody took a uh, measurement from this table and actually created a solution that was custom for this table. And what that means is uh, you know, it will not fit many other tables. And so a, a consumer product company probably would never build anything like this because it's not scalable and it won't fit a, a whole bunch of tables. But that's really the point, is that you no longer have to settle for mass-produced items. You can just build your own.
So uh, in the past, in order to build something like that, you would have had to have a machine shop like this. And not only would you have to own all these different machines, you'd actually have to know how to operate all those different machines. You may even have to apprentice under somebody. Uh, now all that has changed. With computer system craftsmanship, you can just think of what you need in your life and very likely make it. So um, I, hopefully you can see that uh, how computer system craftsmanship can be used to uh, start to change your life. But I wanted to give you a few in-depth examples of how 3D scanning and 3D printing are already being used in a variety of industries. And I thought I'd start with the one we're doing here on stage. I can go through this in detail. So our 3D scanner, like I said, is actually three systems in one. The probe is a three millimeter diameter probe uh, that goes in the ear, and it produces a ring of light at the very tip of the device. And we use laser triangulation to reconstruct that uh, laser. What we're to, I want to take a second, though, on laser triangulation and explain how that works. So it's best to understand this in two dimensions. So you can see there, there's a camera and a projector. Uh, we start by projecting a light on a surface. And so uh, in this example, you can imagine a laser pointer. And if you take that laser pointer, project it onto a surface, and then you attach, rigidly attach a camera to it, um, we can actually figure out the distance between the laser pointer and the camera. And we, we can find that distance. We can call that the baseline. Um, as that laser spot hits the surface, we can take a picture of that and figure out the angle that that laser makes inside the camera. And as the surface gets closer and farther, that angle will change. So if we combine the baseline, the distance between the camera and the projector, with the angle that it makes, we can actually determine the distance to the surface using triangulation. So that's why it's a laser triangulation. You can expand that further into 3D and imagine instead of a laser spot, we project a laser line onto that surface. And it's pretty much the same thing. We take a picture of the laser line and then every pixel along that laser line, we calculate the distance from the laser projector and the camera to the surface. And you can see even uh, further if we take that uh, same thought and we turn it into other structures and ways of making light. So in this case, we are creating a little ring of light and uh, that's really well suited for scanning tubes or ear canals in our case. Uh, but it's pretty much the same thing. You take a picture of the laser hitting the surface, and then we figure out the angle along each pixel, and we determine the distance to it. So um, when we have those, those rings of light, we're actually creating little cross-sections of the, of the ear. And what we need to do is stitch all those cross-sections together. Um, in order to do that, we use a tracking system. So those dots that we have on the headset are actually uh, a coded pattern. And what we do is we take a picture of it with the two cameras that you see on the, the sides of our scanner. We figure out the position, we decode the, uh, the dots, and then we figure out the position of the scanner with incredible precision. And we do that at 20 frames per second, so we're doing it in real time. So one of the benefits, actually, is that if uh, Zoe moves her head or I move my hand, I can actually figure out where the, the scan was, when it, where it was at when I uh, took that scan. Or if I'm missing any data inside, uh, inside the scan, I can actually just point the scanner right back at it and fill it in. Um, so once we get a complete scan of the ear, we actually use a highly automated design software to take that scan and turn it into something that can be 3D printed. So these 3D printers are actually printing Zoe's uh, headphones, and you can see the, the video of the design software. Um, what we end up with is a shell that fits the ear very, very closely. So it's a really comfortable device, uh, but it also provides really good attenuation. So what that means is it kind of acts like a uh, passive noise-canceling headphone. If you've ever seen those in a loud environment, it'll, it'll silence a lot of that stuff so you can hear the sound better. Um, one of the cool things about custom products or custom electronics is actually that they're unique. And what that means is that each one is individually designed. So when we're placing these components, in our case a speaker, we can actually aim that speaker so that it's uh, pointed right at the eardrum and we get really, really good fidelity. But if we were doing something like a wearable product and we were doing biosensors in that wearable product, we could put the biosensor in a place that we know would get good, consistent contact with skin. Um, and so we could, maybe we could decrease the amount of light that needs to be uh, put out for a pulse oximeter, or if we were uh, doing some other sorts of measurements that uh, were subject to motion, we could remove those, uh, those issues from them and actually end up with a more efficient, better uh, biosensor. So the 3D scanner and the 3D printer that I have here on stage actually demonstrate that um, we took a process that took that used to take um, quite a bit of work. So when they, if uh, Zoe wanted to go get custom headphones in the past, she'd have to go to an audiologist and get a silicone impression. And uh, what they would do is they'd take that silicone impression um, out. Well, actually, you'd have to ship it to a custom headphone manufacturer. They'd take it out of the box at the other end, and a highly trained technician would take it out of the box. He'd cut off a piece with a knife in some areas, or he might add uh, material in other areas with wax. He'd do a whole bunch of these hand modifications. 
and then they would uh, make a transfer mold of that. They would take that transfer mold and they would turn it into an acrylic part, put electronics in there, and then two weeks later, Zoe would have her headphones. And so it took a whole lot of time and a whole lot of steps in order to get that product before. Well, now we're doing it here on stage in a few minutes uh, with very little skill at each one of these steps. And it's a really good demonstration of how computer assisted craftsmanship can, can change uh, a way a, a product is made. But I wanted to give you more examples than just in consumer products. So I wanted to give you an example in medicine. So uh, knee and hip replacements are a good illustration of where computer assisted craftsmanship is actually being used. Uh, so these surgeries, there's a lot of things that factor into the success of these surgeries. It's the planning of the, the surgeon and it's the execution of the team. There's a whole bunch of stuff that, uh, that factors in, but above, uh, above all else, the number one thing that uh, is, determines the success of the surgery is actually the alignment of the bones when they're done. So uh, an alignment of better than three degrees will result in a revision surgery of only 5%. Uh, only 5% of people who have an alignment better than three degrees will need a revision surgery, while 54% of people who have an alignment worse than three degrees will need a revision surgery. So it's like 10 times more people need a revision surgery if you have a, a bad alignment. Now, as I said, the, the, uh, there's a lot of factors that factor into this, but one of the things that stuck out to me in a meta-study with 29, different, uh, of, of 29 independent um, studies reviewing the uh, total knee replacement surgeries, traditional total knee, re knee replacement surgeries with computer-assisted knee replacement surgeries found that in total knee replacement surgeries that did not use computer-assisted technologies, misalignment occurred 31% of the time, while if they used the computer-assisted technologies, uh, they only occurred 9% of the time. So you can just imagine what it, what it means to the people who underwent that surgery and then the potential revision surgery that this computer-assisted technology reduced the occurrence of misalignment by threefold. It's a... Uh, and then you can also imagine where all the other medical surgeries and things that uh, we could use this technology. It's, it's just a really exciting time for medicine. So you may have, oops, you may have already experienced assisted craftsmanship yourself. Uh, in the dental industry, there are several companies have already created solutions where you could take uh, crown and bridge work and, and automate a lot of those steps. So you can go to a dentist right now and they can 3D scan your teeth with a wand and then they can design a crown and then have it milled all in their lab, or, I mean, all in their uh, office. This process takes uh, about an hour and uh, can be done in a single visit, where the old process would take uh, two or three weeks and it would require several visits to the dentist. And so this is, is really revolutionizing the dentist industry already. Um, so also in fashion, there is a, a whole bunch of stuff that is happening, in jewelry in particular. Uh, a lot of technology has, uh, this already has been uh, integrated in jewelry. So right now you can go to a website and you can pick out which uh, settings and in which styles and which shapes and which uh, patterns you want. You can put them into a custom design, whatever uh, unique pattern you want to do. And you can actually send that to a designer who does a highly automated design software. He'll, he'll combine all those things and do a custom jewelry piece for you. And they'll 3D print it. Uh, then they'll use that to make a cast and metal, and then it will deliver it to you for a lower cost, uh, better product, and faster time. And it's not only the, the customization that is revolutionary. In, in jewelry, they're actually being able to do things they co simply couldn't do before this 3D printing and design software. So they can do really thin walls that are consistent. They can do spirals and prisms and nested designs that they just couldn't do beforehand. Um, and I, I really know jewelry. I actually grew up in a jewelry store. My, uh, my father is a jeweler. He's been doing uh, jewelry for over 40 years. We actually did my wife's engagement in wedding rings using computer-assisted craftsmanship. So that's uh, her engagement ring. And uh, the design we did on the computer, we 3D printed it. We had it cast in platinum. And uh, that whole experience was enabled using computer-assisted craftsmanship. And I think soon you will all experience it, at, at least in some points of your life. So I wanted to give you a little bit more detail on the, the first story, the, the Declaration of Independence, just because it's a really good uh, summation of how computer-assisted craftsmanship can take uh, an engineer and turn him into an artisan. So what happened was the, the National Archives Museum uh, was looking to update their, their cases that surround the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and a whole bunch of other documents. Um, and so they, they wanted to make some improvements to the design, like they wanted to uh, make it into a rounded design that, more, that, batched, that matched the rotunda walls a little better. Uh, they wanted to do some in, in security enhancements. They wanted to do a whole bunch of upgrades to modernize it, essentially. And uh, they did it all on the computer initially. And uh, what, what happened was when they got the proofs back to see what the design looked like, it actually looked really, really mechanical. It didn't have the same look and feel of the original. 
Um, and so they ended up calling me to see if I could help out, and we came up with a solution uh, to, to help them out. But at the time, we didn't know about computer-assisted craftsmanship. We didn't really know. So we just called it digital restoration. But essentially, we did exactly what I, I'm describing here, uh, which is kind of it's just a cool story. So, um, so you can see in the top of the screen there, the original bronze case, when people had come to look for over 100 years at the documents, they put their hands on the bronze case surrounding the documents, and they had worn out a lot of the detail. And so what we did was we scanned that original, we uh, scaled it up five times, and so uh, we could use a computer to do stuff to it. We actually 3D printed it, so that purple thing that I'm working on there is uh, the, the scaled up model. We 3D printed it, and then I added uh, clay to it. So that green stuff is actually just clay that I'm adding back to the, to the leaves. So I added detail to the leaves, the stems, the seeds, and then I 3D scanned the whole thing and I shrank it back down. And so I not only got it to the right size when I shrank it back down, but I was able to decrease uh, all my imperfections. So it looked like I was a master craftsman when I, I'm really not. Uh, so it was, it was really cool. Uh, and then uh, they actually used this, uh, this casting pattern on the bottom to, to make bronze cases. And so now when you go to the National Archives Museum, you can see my work uh, surrounding all of the, the, our nation's most treasured documents. It's a, it's a pretty fun project. So uh, computer-assisted craftsmanship, I believe it'll change the way that you do things at home. It'll change a lot of aspects of your life. You'll be able to print whatever you want, be able to build whatever you want. It's, uh, it's also going to change the way uh, companies deliver products to you. They're no, they're no longer going to have to uh, make mass-produced products as much. They're going to be able to make much more higher-performance products with personalization and, and things like that that are not really were not really possible before. Um, so... We have actually a demonstration of that here. Hope they're done. So Zoe's headphones are actually done. These are custom molded to her ears. Do you have any music on your phone? Um, yeah. So that's, that's right ear. Red for right, blue for left. All right, and so we're gonna try and listen to some music. How do they sound? Oh, it has nothing to play yet. <laughs> <laughs> That was just one example of how a product can be customized, and I believe it's going to happen a lot more. Um, the beauty of this technology is how versatile it is. It'll change every uh, consumer product we buy. It'll change even uh, sports equipment and uh, historical restoration, how we do historical restoration. We are entering a time where, with, uh, we are entering a time where we're not only enabling mass customization, we're expecting it. We are entering a time where, with the right tools, everyone can be craftsmen. Thank you.